So tonight we are going to be talking about what is the General Aviation Joint Safety Committee. Um, used to be steering, they changed it to safety. Topic of the month, which is transition trainings. But we're going to focus this to gliders, which is very true. Uh, probably more so than we deal with in airplanes, the typical glider pilot will be involved in some level of transition training. So tonight we're going to go over, this is just the major topics, loss of control, getting started, tow pilot, tow plane, we'll do that quickly, student pilots, single seat and club glider upgrades, launch procedures, new to you gliders uh, for the members of your club. And I am going to talk about what is a four letter word, according to our former FAA administrator, Aloda, and there have been changes to that. And that is absolutely terrific, but I want to make sure that because it what still remains with LOTAs apply to transition training. They existed before all of the rigmarole we went through over the last couple of years even. Uh, so I want to make sure that we do hit upon that. Now, the GAJSC, that's General Aviation Joint Safety Committee. I'm going to keep remembering to get that out crystal clear because I keep wanting to use the old terminology, you know, takes a look at accidents within all aircraft and looks at some of the things that are issues with that. And these are some of them, but one of them you'll see right here at the bottom of this list is transition training. And in the glider world, you may have seen some presentations I do. This is older from fiscal year 2021, where, you know, we have a few accidents. I, I go through the stats. This is just raw numbers uh, with it. This does not contain fiscal year 2022, which we just ended in last October. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more. But this gives you an idea of the accidents we have. And then correspondingly, here's one of the things associated with transition training is I always do take a look at the time and type uh, for the people that have accidents in gliders. And you'll notice down here, we have a large grouping and you'll even notice three or four. And this isn't even all of the accidents from fiscal year 2021. That's just the ones that had final reports where we could see that information. But really about one of, out of every four accidents, it seems over the years, occurs in people that have less than 25 hours time in type. And that's not just students that have less than 25 hours um, or less total time. Actually, you'd be surprised at how many accidents and how many insurance claims are paid on first flights in new to you gliders. And when we look at this, that kind of falls in line. When we look at the accidents and the FAA's perspective of it, most of them by far, the primary causal accident is pilot-induced error. This is for gliders. This isn't for all aircraft types. And this is just fiscal year 2021 accidents. But Rob and John, you deal with the accidents in your area. I mean, I suspect it looks similar, but maybe here in the glider world, you're recognizing the pilot-induced error is even greater percentage than in other aircraft types. Is that true? Yeah, we see that in our area. Um, Steve, the Portland FISDO covers Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont for the accidents that happen up there. This chart looks what looks uh, pretty familiar. <laughs> it does. And this probably looks even more familiar. When we look at the contributing accidents, you'll notice most of them. Again, this is for gliders in the fiscal year 2021 uh, for the FAA. You know, even most of these are related to pilot-induced error. And then correspondingly, when we look at accidents within the FAA, and again, fiscal year 2021 here, is we look at the nine areas of responsibility and airman competency comes up in quite a few of those in the glider world. So what we're gonna be talking about is stepping up primarily tonight. You know, some of us are that person in the 233, looking at that glass ship once we get our certificate and what we're going to move up to. Others are looking at, you know, doing something a little bit different in terms of launch procedures, or maybe to have the independence of a motor glider or the safety that they feel they gather with having 
a sustainer engine, whatever it may end up being. But we usually think of this as moving up into larger and more complex aircraft. But we do want to also think about it in terms of other aircraft types too. You know, is a typical person maybe at a club here in the U.S., you know, gets in a 233, steps into a 126 maybe, is looking at that hot two-seat ship, and then even, you know, wants that high-performance um, club class or 18-meter glider with it. And there definitely are a lot of transitional steps associated with it. But one last little thing just to remember is even if you're that person stepping down, you need to realize it. You know, I have had a few discussions with people that have gotten in a 126 for the first time in 25 years or something, and they're a little bit surprised with how touchy, light, and maybe not the soaring performance. And us glider instructors, as we do like preseason checkouts, we even see, you know, some people that have been flying for years in their own ship struggle with just a, flying a 233. And when we look at the accident rates, this is for standard aircraft versus amateur built. And then I added on the glider uh, to this presentation here, which is what we see. Again, you can get more details on that. And what I have found in terms of experimental aircraft in the airplane world is really it's that first 50 hours where things are dangerous. And for sport aircraft, it's really more so the people stepping down that have more oops in light sport aircraft than actually the sport pilots do. You know, and that's very true. This type of light sport aircraft, I've flown in a fair amount and it's terrific aircraft. I love flying it, but there are some little, I don't want to say gutches, but things you need to realize, you know, it's a very light, very short coupled elevator on it in terms of how long the arm is, therefore big elevator stabilator associated with it, but also recommended speeds may change. It stalls down below 35 miles per hour, but the approach speed recommended is over 50 miles per hour so that you have enough elevator authority to, you know, rotate the nose in the flare. Little things like that come up when you do transition training. So getting started on your end, if you're doing some transition training, you wanna make sure you're reading the book and there's a lot of things you can gather out of the manual, maybe not so many things. Sometimes manuals get updated too. Just so happens I have sitting here, oops, why did I lose it? There we go. Sitting here at my desk, you know, the newest version, I believe, unless I haven't checked in the last year, but just came out last year on the 233 manual. Greatly updated. They updated it for the new 233B model, and they completely redid the manual for the A models also in relation to it. So great thing to do. Get a hold of the manual and start going through reading it. Maybe at your club, you have a club briefing paper for each type of aircraft, which is a terrific way to get out the information you need to know. That's something that should be updated as time goes on. <clears throat> you know, it might be in number specific. I even know a few clubs out there that have a sign off on it, even know a few that have started doing videos with it, you know, and it doesn't have to be specific to your club. You know, this Tom's tips on flying the Schweitzer 233s. I've used that. You know, he lets it be reprinted. I think it's Caesar Creek Soaring is where on their website now is where you can get it. Uh, but I print those out just because it's got the information that you're not going to find in the manual, but it'll be helpful for someone that is flying the 233. And it's very helpful for the transitioning pilots, you know, the airplane pilots that are transitioning into gliders and are finding maybe the 233, although it is like the 150, 152 kind of, of the airplane world, it doesn't fly like the 150, 152 of the airplane world. And so, you know, you can also do things. I, I do some of this myself, build a quiz um, 
on it or even do note cards. There's some stuff from when I was doing the Eclipse things. And not only did I use those for myself, but I used them when I was testing people uh, on it. I also, with the FAA flight program and jumping around to lots of different types of aircraft, I get a new one <clears throat> and we'll make a quiz about it. It makes me dig in. And then from there, I will <clears throat> retake that quiz every year or so. Sitting in the cockpit, you know, the blind cockpit check, but just getting the layout, the tactile feel of where things are, how does it work? You know, having the question, I strongly, strongly encourage this. Granted, in the off months here, like we have in parts of the USA uh, and Canada, you may not be able to sit in the aircraft itself right away. Uh, but, you know, on those off days early in the morning before anybody's flying or at the end of the day when it's being put back in the tie down, that's a terrific time to sit down, you know, and just kind of start touching things is what it really comes down to. And what does that do? How does it work? Finding out that sort of stuff. The other thing I have done in aircraft and becoming familiar with this is I'll sit and I'll run the emergency or abnormal procedures while sitting in the cockpit. Because, you know, like these motor gliders here, some aircraft have a lot of switches. Thankfully, most gliders don't, but you get in a STEMI, it does. <laughs> yeah, is there's some switches, some buttons, some controls that you may not really ever touch other than when you are dealing with an emergency or abnormal situation. So it's a good way to kind of learn those procedures while learning the aircraft. For the instructors out there, I do this. I know others that do what I kind of call the quick extended memory, <laughs> but on different aircraft, I'll make a little bit of a cheat sheet uh, that has, you know, speeds, weights, different things like that. Stuff that you normally will remember, but some days you'll be like, uh, is that the B or the E model of the 120? I can't remember. So that's a great little thing you can do out there. <clears throat> and in a broad sense, this is a challenge, I think, in the glider world, because, you know, it's so club centric, but you can reach out and with, you know, internet based things, even like Zoom that we're doing now, there's much more opportunity for this. But finding an instructor that is current in the make and model that you're looking for the training in, you know, you can use type clubs, that sort of stuff. The SSA instructor program is great. You know, want to be following syllabus, knowing what's coming up, when, how, what you can do so that you, your budget is on mark, time and money. You know, you may even want to talk to a few different instructors. We have a lot of instructors tonight. And we all know this as instructors. You know, we're all human. And personality-wise, we may not work as well with some personalities as we do with others. And that may be something that you come across and find. So you might not want to work with instructor A because you get along better with instructor B. You, you know, that's okay. Find out who is right for you. You know, taking a look at their experience, communication style, as I was talking about there. You know, and get the required training is just getting the right instructor. Developing your personal minimums is a big thing. And then if you're getting into higher performance aircraft, you know, open class, 18 meter type stuff with water ballast, you may want to do a flight or two, even on a calm day, uh, you know, where there's not much lifting action, just near the maximum weight so that you can feel how the aircraft feels. You know, it can greatly change in some aircraft roll rates on the ailerons. Um, big, big difference. So let's talk about the airplane side just a little bit. I'm not going to spend much time here. But related to airplanes primarily is there is a lot of regulatory required training that you can look at as transition training. You know, we have a requirement for tailwheel endorsement. 
that requires flight and ground training with an authorized instructor, which is different from getting the endorsement in order to tow gliders. You can do that with someone who doesn't hold the flight instructor certificate, some of the flying in the airplane, but you can't go get a tailwheel endorsement from someone that doesn't hold a flight instructor airplane, uh, probably single engine, I would suspect, um, endorsement and on their flight instructor certificate. High altitude, we don't normally worry about in tow planes or air um, or gliders, but the one exception there that I can think of is probably the Pearl Am <laughs> uh, project is that is the one that is required if flying above 25,000 feet in a pressurized aircraft, you need the high altitude training. And it is pressurized aircraft. It's not pressurized airplane. That being said, I have the asterisk there because that is an important thing if you're going to ever do wave flying um, in gliders. You're going to be dealing with some high altitude concepts, issues, all of that. Tow pilot training, we were talking about complex endorsement is for airplanes, doesn't apply to gliders. That's something a little bit different. High performance, it, that's for greater than 200 horsepower airplanes. Again, doesn't apply to gliders, but it does apply to airplanes. And this is something that we end up seeing in the tow pilot world. And then launch procedure. Primarily, that's glider oriented, but there are also some things like ground launches that we don't have any requirement for training the ground launch operator, and that can be important. So transition training can apply there too. As I mentioned, tow operations, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on. It's a future topic, but when you're thinking about transitioning to new tow planes or even initial tow plane training, you want to be aware of the high performance endorsement. You see that occasionally where someone say the biggest thing they've ever flown is a 180 horsepower Cub, and then they get into the 265 Pawnee, probably more than capable of flying it. However, you know, if something does happen insurance wise or regulatory wise, you may want to um, be there. And it's not required in initial pilot training. Complex used to be, it's not necessarily anymore. Uh, there are substitutes for that. You know, and the classic is the tricycle gear versus tailwheel, but also training tow pilots have seen differences in, you know, the style of gear suspension wise, going between steel spring gear versus bungee versus piston versus, you know, like in this collar, the coiled um steel spring and even some things about wheel landings versus three point uh you know the regulatory requirement is the person needs to be trained on both unless the manufacturer recommends against it which there are a couple out there but i haven't seen many uh in relation to it but i have seen people that have a tailwheel endorsement um and have, have flown aircraft that they technically can do both in, but the flight school has only trained them in three-point landings because maybe that's all the instructor was comfortable with. Who knows? Transition training for tow operations, you know, it, it's kind of like that real estate thing. It's location, location, location is probably one of the biggest things. Density, altitude, what type of gliders are being towed, you know, performance-wise. Competition towing is vastly different from day-to-day -day club operations, maybe some differences in tow hooks, handle location in tow planes, especially if a club has more than one signaling water ballast on the gliders. Um, you know, tow pilots have had exciting looks at trees, I guess, in the past where, you know, they've pulled up and somebody is fully ballasted with water and the tow pilot doesn't know it at all and is wondering, you know, why is it so lethargic this time or apparently so? 
you know, these are all things to be thinking about and considering. And what it comes down to is, you know, is it legal or is it safe? You know, transition training for the type of tailwheel aircraft you might be flying, you, you might need some training, even though you have that endorsement. And a lot of clubs have kind of recognized that depending upon what they have in their fleet. We deal with transition training, especially in the glider world for student pilots. And we almost always, especially here in the US, deal with this um, in the solo portion is it's not unusual. A lot of clubs out there here in the US are using 233s to do the primary training, but may have 126s or something similar in the fleet. You know, if they're lucky, maybe they got PW6s and PW5s um, and can do that transition, which is much more so. But I'm highlighting here, you know, this is the little bit of regulation copying that we have to do as an FAA person, it seems. But, you know, in their training, they have to do the flight training maneuvers, procedures appropriate to the make and model of aircraft to be flown. And then they either need to do that training in that make and model of aircraft or similar make and model of aircraft to be flown. Now that raises the question, what is a similar make and model? And, you know, as instructors, even we learn over the years uh, and approach things maybe differently than we did then. And I'm giving you kind of my background to this exactly what it is, I don't know. I don't know of any legal interpretation of it. I've never seen one. Um, you know, I've never really seen any guidance other than it says, well, a similar make and model. Yeah. In, the, in my past world, where I was doing instruction a lot, exclusively in airplanes, when I was asked this question, I used to refer people to the type certificate data sheet. And the way those are written out, like up here in the corner, let me grab the pen or the highlighter. There we go. I think, let me change that over. There we go. Now I get the highlighter. Oh, I still get a pen. Uh, on the type certificate data, data sheet, there's my Boston accent. You can see the 126, you know, it's the make is SGS. Model 126, the series is the letter beyond it. Same thing, I use the Nimbus here even as a um, example with it. There we go. There we go. Now it's popping up. Mm -hmm. But what I used to recommend to people was, you know, different series. Look at the type certificate data sheet. If you train in a Cessna 150B, you know, you could do 150M or even the 152 because they all are on the same type certificate data sheet. Now, teaching in gliders, I don't believe that. It's just, you know, based upon experience, time, and many other factors, you know, my opinion to that has changed because I didn't have anything solid regulatory to fall upon. What I basically advise people now is it should fly similar to it. Do you as an instructor think that it does? You know, is think about it this way. Is it similar enough that you feel comfortable signing the student off and are willing to deal with as an instructor and professional, the regulatory and civil liabilities that are part of having that level of expertise? I.e., you know, worst case scenario, Let's just say something were to happen uh, for someone that you had signed off in a similar make and model aircraft, usually single seat. Would you be comfortable, you know, defending it to your fellow instructors, to the insurance company, to the FAA, or even worst case scenario is a civil case there. Now, one of the things that we do see quite often with this is another part of the regulation that is missed. And let me clear out. I'm just noticing, I apologize. I see there's still some drawings left on there. There we go. 
But <clears throat> another part of the regulation says that part of the pre-solo knowledge test covers the flight characteristics and operational limitations for the make and model of the aircraft to be flown. So what I would encourage and emphasize is if you are operating in a club, say that has a 233, and then you have students soloing later in the 126 before they get their pilot certificate, is you probably, or you should, let me rephrase it that way, you should be doing an addendum of some sort to the pre-solo knowledge test where you're covering the test and reviewing it to 100% on the flight characteristics and operational limitations for the make and model of aircraft, i.e. the 126. So think about it. You're going to cover part 61, part 91, the airspace rules for the airport where the solo flight will be performed, and the flight characteristics ultimately for the 233 and the 126 if that's what you're sending them out in. And with that, this is something to think about as people step up later on is in your club, do you have a checkout quiz for each of your types of aircraft? Could be beneficial, definitely could. So beyond the student pilot, what you get in the club is usually people wanting to get into the single seat aircraft, after, you know, say you've been training in K-21s and then they want to get into a little bit higher performance single seat that you might have in the club, you know, stepping up through what the club has available in it. And there's a lot of things available out there. I've used for years the Bob Wander book. Uh, you can see it folded over from sticking it in my back pocket. Uh, and it really does cover a lot of what we're touching on here. You know, and what I've done, this is just some of them as I had opened it up last week. You know, I have little things written in the margins um, with it. additional points. There's a good checklist in the appendices, you know, but these are things that I don't necessarily always see in the um, manual, but I do end up covering with people, you know, like if it has your warning. How does that end up being activated? How does that system work? You know, what happens if you land out at an air, another airport and you're going to be doing an unassisted takeoff? Is that smart? Is it not? You know, talk about how you know the difference between the dive brakes and the flaps in it. One thing, pre-flight and parachute use is something that a lot of people probably haven't dealt with before and possibly the interference in the aircraft. So that's always something good to hit upon too. You can also use for other guidance, some FAA type of stuff. And we will be coming out with a new glider flying handbook soon. Um, I haven't yet dug into it, but they have sent me a draft to it. But you can take a look at the practical test standards and kind of go through each area of operation and or the tasks in it for that particular glider. What's different? Have that as a discussion point. You can also review, you know, the chapter headings as it may have those over on the side here of the glider flying handbook. I've done that in the past. <clears throat> I have a few asterisks next to the PTS one. I just want to warn everybody, it's a known error, um, but the examiner checklist in the private pilot glider is missing the last few areas of operation. It's um, on page 14. There should be a page 15 also, but it is not there. It's missing. Um, so just do be aware of that. Yeah, in other parts of the practical test standards, it has all... 10, 11 uh, areas of operation, but I think it only goes up to area of operation eight in the private pilot examiner checklist portion, which again is page 14 and 15. Rear seat training, this is another type of transition we deal with in gliders. And, you know, I'm sure this is a debate that can occur out there uh, with many instructors over, you know, beverages of choice, but some things to think about. Does your uh, club have any policy on it? 
you know, is it required on any check ride? What do you cover? You know, that's something that is interesting. If you put a bunch of instructors together, I bet you you'd come up with you know, 30 different answers to each of these questions uh, with it. You know, is it required on a check ride? There's really not much that I can think of that I've seen over the years uh, beyond FAR 6143 and FAR 6145, you know, having dual controls, unless yada, 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 that sort of thing. <clears throat> you really, you do see it as you get into bigger aircraft. Those of you that, you know, fly larger aircraft work-wise, corporate airlines, you're probably familiar with flight standardization board reports that have specific requirements of where people sit, what they have for equipment, that sort of thing with it. I'm, I'll give you my personal instructor philosophy here, and I emphasize here, this is my personal philosophy associated with the flying from the rear seat. And, and I'm saying that because most gliders two seat are tandem, not all, but most. <clears throat> so that's what we normally deal with. Um, you know, and it is aircraft dependent too, you know, and your club needs to do it. Particularly what my club has been doing is um, has it as like a separate checkout and sign off for each of the aircraft. Just that way we know and correspondingly in terms of the insurance uh, coverage that the person was specifically trained uh, to be able to fly that particular type of aircraft from the rear seat. Usually it's has um, all the same controls on it. With private pilot students, people working towards their private pilot, and this is usually in the 233, <laughs> so the flight instructors out there will pick this up quick um, with it. I usually do one flight after they've soloed, but before they've gotten their um, certificate with them just flying around from the rear seat, we'll go through and do some of the things in the PTS, like steep turns, stalls, traffic pattern, landing, launch, that sort of thing. Really, more so than anything, what it usually ends up being is what I would call a scare ride. It just shows them how different it is, and it kind of sets that tone. 99.9% um, .9 of people are like, whoa, I didn't realize that was that difficult or that small, or I couldn't, I felt like I couldn't do anything. Yeah, <laughs> it makes them realize, and they're like, okay, I'm not going to jump in and fly this aircraft from the rear seat without additional training. Yeah, it's kind of funny. It's what gives, I think they have a lot more respect for the instructors after they've um, done that. And I've never, I personally have never heard of a private pilot applicant doing a check ride from the rear seat. Again, for me, with people working on their commercial, I'll have them do a fair amount of the training from the rear seat. And I do expect uh to see them do the standards or meet the standards from the rear seat uh because most if not all operations that they'll likely be doing as a commercial pilot and gliders will involve scenic flights experience flights that sort of thing which typically are from the rear seat i know that's a debate in and of itself not everybody will do that not everybody agrees but i think that's probably the most common thing that i see within the glider community. And then I leave it up to them on what seat they use in the check ride. I've had a couple now, I think, uh, that have done their check rides for the commercial from the rear seat. That's usually also people that are just working uh, directly towards their CFI. Again, nothing that specifically states that I've been able to find, like in the practical test standards or anywhere that in the glider world, the applicant has to do the check ride from the rear seat, but that's where they typically would be because most of the controls are in the forward or command seat <clears throat> for it. Um, I haven't had anybody that I can recall on a direct CFI check ride that's wanted to fly from the front. And if I did, I probably would have a little bit of a discussion with them about you know, risk management, and what it is that they're trying to do and 
how they're working towards getting someone to be able to solo the aircraft, be the pilot in command, how you're working through those steps and stuff like that. I, I'm, it's kind of a scenario here. If I did, I might let them do one launch and landing and say, okay, let's just pretend maybe this is an intro flight and what would you do? I might let them do that one, but most of it I'm going to uh, expect them to be flying from the rear. I do recall I did have once on a re-exam, somebody that was being re-examined on their flight instructor certificate and um, wanted to fly from the front. It wasn't a regular CFI check ride. It was a re-exam. Uh, and I basically <laughs> said, this here is the instructor. We went through the same discussion. I let him do one uh, launch and landing from the front, but then I required the rest from the rear. And I emphasize there, what you're hearing there is my personal uh, instructor opinion. Important, helps a lot on transition training, but also regular training and if people are moving through the gliders if you have the capabilities to do this and we'll talk about another way a little bit later on but you probably want to work with them sit them in the aircraft and work on some sight pictures with them you know what does it look like when you're rolling down the runway for launch what does it look like before you start the launch procedure you know is it nose up nose down you know is different in different aircraft what does it look like when the wing is level? What does it look like if you're just about to catch a wingtip and you're in the takeoff role? That's an important sight picture to get people to recognize because that's when they should be pulling the release. What does it look like in landing? Where should they be looking? You know, in the canopy, what portions, you know, what are the sights they're going to see nearby in their peripheral, peripheral vision? All of that. What does it look like if they, here, I got the model right. <laughs> you know, what does it look like if they over rotate on um, landing? You know, if they get the tail too low so that they're going to strike the tail hard. Hard to do in a 233, but easy to do in some other trainers that are out there. You know, what you basically what I'm saying is you want to make sure that you work to get the correct line sight. And then even, you know, I think now that I'm thinking of this, John, this is you in a 233, is it not? Yeah, that was me, Steve. <laughs> that was, you, you, you had been kind enough to set me up for a flight. Yeah, <laughs> well, correspondingly, I mean, this is probably, that was probably one of your first times in a glider, although you've flown and taught in a lot of airplanes over the years. You know, the sight pictures and the sensations are just so different. You know, you're sitting there, it probably felt a little bit weird to be sitting with that nose down on the ground. And I I can't recall, but it happens often in 233s, depending upon how much power there is in the tow plane, how much the pilots weigh, and how fast the tow pilot puts in the power. But it might have popped up quite a bit and went back to its tail before coming back you know and that's that's a big difference in what it looks like and you know you're a tall enough person that really didn't affect you but we do have this you occasionally when you're doing this with people in gliders um like 233 some of the old k6s k8s uh they might need bigger cushions or maybe even smaller cushions in some aircraft you know, when you're doing that sight picture uh, discussion, you're like, okay, now looking over the nose at the end of the runway. Oh, I can't see the end of the runway. Huh? And you get out in front, you look, and you look, wow, you are, you're looking at the panel. We need to get you up higher. <laughs> you know, that's one of the benefits that you get out of this. Hmm. Launch procedures. There's the regulatory aspect of launch procedures. You know, we have these three different types of it, and that is definitely a type of transition training we can go through in gliders. The one thing to highlight here, and I have come across this, is all three launch procedures require that it is both ground and flight training. I have occasionally come across, more so in the motor glider world, 
Um, but I have occasionally come across where people are endorsed to fly motor gliders self-launch, uh, never having received any flight training on it, just a ground briefing. And that is contrary to the regulations there. And that's just what the definition does is of flight training, which is in FAR 61.1, you know, but you would think, oh, well, this is easy. Well, it's really not. And the motor glider pilots out there that have moved around the different styles of motor gliders are probably well aware of this. You know, we have the touring motor gliders out there like the Groves and the um, Diamond Extremes and that sort of thing that are very, very much like an airplane. You know, you're never going to hook up a nose hook to them or a winch or anything. They're always going to end up using the engine. Then you have self-launch gliders, you know, with a mast and engine that they're capable of self-launching, even approved for uh, self-launching, but also have tow hooks for aero tow and or uh, winch launching. Some that are um, sustainer engines only. And even those I have seen people that it's listed as a sustainer engine only, not approved for self-launch in the manual or something like that. But they like to get out there on that long 11,000 foot long runway and self-launch um, with it. So, you know, it, that ends up saying, well, when do I need it? When do I not need it? Well, the endorsement is for self-launch. That's what you specifically do need it for. And in an FAA sense, I'll answer the question with it. Well, it depends. <laughs> you know, I is, is it a self-launch engine and you know you're self-launching, not aero towing? You need to have the self-launch endorsement. Is it a sustainer only and that's what you're using it for? You know, you probably don't need the self-launch endorsement. However, that being said, do you need training? Yeah, I go back to like so many things, it's you need to do the right thing. You know, is it legal? Is it safe? Is it courteous? You know, the endorsement is specifically for the launch procedure, which is self-launch. But if you're dealing with an engine, it's vastly different. You know, the drag that's put out there by the pod propeller engine is significant. You know, I, I know I've I've watched some of it. Dave Nadler does some stuff. He'll probably be at the SSA convention again. You know, terrific information on the reliability of engines. But you also talk to the people that fly and, you know, the reliability or the issues that develop. You know, it doesn't close all the way. You get a door that's stuck open. You can't get the propeller lined up. You know, the engine won't start. The engine won't stop. <laughs> you know, whatever it may end up being. Uh, I haven't seen anything on the legal interpretations either. So, you know, what I would really just emphasize is like any good pilot, any good flight instructor, you need to work within your community to determine the hazards, the risks, and the risk mitigations and make it as safe as possible. And the aspect of this is self-launch training is hard or finding it is hard. You know, it's going to likely require some travel for the majority of people. You're probably also going to find that it's going to likely be in a touring motor glider versus, you know, a sailplane that's motorized, uh, if I can use that terminology. It's also probably not going to be identical to your glider, so you're going to need some same transition training anyways. There's some other aspects of it that you want to be aware of from a regulatory standpoint. And we'll talk about that in the LOTA. And I, I've even come across this a couple of times. Uh, you know, there's an old advisory circular from the 1980s when the self-launch requirement came out. And it has some training guidelines uh, for people that already hold a clutter rating, um, but to get the endorsement in the um, initial cadre type of endorsement type of thing. In reality, that advisory circular is very dated, needs to be rescinded and or updated. I, I've mentioned this to the branch that controls it. 
uh, it still is out there. You'll notice you take a look at it, that advisory circular is so dated, it doesn't cover anything on student pilots on getting training in a motor glider from the beginning. You know, and even some of the others, you do ground tow, you might have gotten approved for winch launch uh, training, but the endorsement is for ground tow. And would you be comfortable doing an auto tow or even a bungee tow? I'm, I don't think I'd be. I, the thing I kind of got out of it is, was I capable of doing the winch tow? Yes. But it really made me aware that I really should be practicing it regularly and you know, should be doing some review training with it regularly. And I know there's a DPE in the um, Washington, D.C. area that I've talked to once or twice briefly about it. And, you know, he purposely does try to make sure that he stays up to date and current and regularly doing winch launches uh, just because it can be a risky environment, especially if you do things that are wrong. So we also in the club deal with people that, you know, that get that grin on their face with a glider that is new to them. And it's usually associated with a glass step up, the glass glider that you end up hearing about. And going up with any step, there's added risks. There's added benefits, definitely. But there's also added risks. You know, landing gear may be something they haven't dealt with and could end up, you know, dealing with some scrapes such as we have here. You know, differences in wingspan or water ballast, rigging, critical assembly, positive control checks, can't emphasize enough. You know, and then even there's some performance risks. We see this in the airplane world, but I've seen it in the glider world too, where people see the extra performance and look at that as a safety buffer, which, it can be in certain circumstances, but that added performance may also make you decide to take risks that you may not normally take and put you in a much more hazardous situation. So that's a discussion you want to have if you're working with someone on transition training, going to a glass glider kind of for the first time. And with that, you know, I focused a lot here on the instructors. Uh, I'm going to put a little bit back towards those that are looking forward to moving up to glass or moving up to it, you know, kind of the student of transition training, whether you're rated or not, but always, you know, be that good student, show up on time, schedule ahead. I, I've seen this more than once now of people that get a new glider or whatever and show up at the field at noon on Saturday on a beautiful soaring day and start pestering the instructor that's on duty that day. Hey, can you check me out my new glider? I want to fly it today. You know, I, I need a ground briefing for insurance or something like that. And it's like, hold it. <laughs> there's a lot going on. One, two, there's no preparation for me as the instructor. And it's showing me that there's no preparation that you've had as the student. We should have talked about this well in advance. So, you know, don't be that person. I've actually had it happen once, uh, which I loved how this instructor handled it. <laughs> I was at a, another club doing some work and literally had the student with a new glider show up and hit up the senior instructor I was talking to about this, you know, and they kind of looked at me, looked back at the student and said, yeah, that's great, but first, let me introduce you here to Inspector Brown from the FAA. <laughs> yeah. They kind of used me as their get out of jail free card. But what I'm getting at is be the good student because instructors do love the good students. Show up on time, be prepared, already have done some of the pre-work like we talked about in here and be ready to learn. You know, take notes, take pictures, videos, ask the questions. You know, the instructor... Every good instructor is going to be willing to spend the time that you need, and they're going to appreciate working, getting somebody up, experiencing new and great things in a glider, as long as they're the good student. And stepping up into the glass glider or similar will probably have some 
insurance requirements. You know, single seat aircraft, uh, usually you'll see a clause that it requires at least a checkout briefing by the instructor. You know, and I, I bring that back to the other thing. Is that 30 minutes or is it a full day? What's needed? What's the person's background? You know, the instructor needs to be prepped for this transition training in addition to the student. Some insurance, time and similar performance. Um, the insurance company that I deal with, uh, I know they have this, is if you're getting into, you know, a higher, what would call a higher performance glider by their standards, is you need five hours in a glider that has a published glide ratio of 35 to one or better uh, before they will cover you an insurance. So that might end up being going someplace for some dual training. And then I put this out there for those clubs. Does your club have the opportunity for that, whether it be dual or maybe even solo um, within the club? in order to provide that opportunity for its members ahead of time. Uh, you know, the club itself with this insurance policy may just have, you know, the ground briefing for a single seat glider, regardless of what its performance is. But the person will need that time in that club glider that's better than 35 to 1 in order to obtain insurance on their own personal glider. And for the motor glider types, I have heard you know, similar to that is five or 10 hours minimum um, experience in the make and model even um, when it has been um, two seat motor gliders. When we talk about glass, this is, you know, the new challenge to it is it's not just the glider. I know a couple of years ago, I was talking to another instructor and I had somebody come in to ask me about, you know, checking them out in glass and from our prior conversation I'm like what do you mean I don't I can't think of a G3000 in any glider off the top of my head I, what do you got an LX9000 in it or what and, yeah I just the mindset just wasn't there but now especially at the higher end newer gliders and it's making its way down like we've seen in other aircraft we're starting to get a lot of glass panels in there. It's changing greatly. It's the same thing even for handheld devices. You know, it's going to take some time. What's great is the extended training we have with like Zoom and other stuff now. Also, some companies, I know Cumulus Soaring has done it. Um, seen other bits at Wings and Wheels and Craig Arrow and others. But LX Nav has a whole series of tutorials now on their products, you know, and you can even sit down and do some Zoom, Skype, FaceTime, whatever, you know, it may be worth the money for you to pay for a couple hours of ground training, you know, on your device with somebody that knows and understands it. In transitioning people up to, you know, the new to you glider, you want to discuss other things too, the wing runner, understanding what the differences are going to be in launch and making sure that the pilot can communicate that. You know, some gliders recommend taking off with the dive brakes open in the beginning part of the uh, takeoff roll uh, for various reasons. That's something that people may not be expecting and you could have people calling for an abort or getting a bit loud on the radio. You know, wingspan has a huge difference you know an open class versus a 13 and a half meter and it's not only you know the height for the wing on the wing runner in the open class probably the changing of height with it but it's also you know the torque is it's probably more detrimental you see there we go <laughs> i gotta put it right in front of my face with the uh, background on there but you know if they end up holding back on the wing or push the wing forward, there's a tremendous amount of torque on that that's going to have an impact on the fuselage in the takeoff roll. You know, water ballast, winglets, that's something. I mean, how many people have caught their finger um, with winglets or pulled on them too much or caught it in the aileron, you know, where to hold? And then also what it looks like 
inside, you know, belted up and things situated is wing runners will know in general, but you get a ship that's new to the club. That's something that everybody's going to have to learn. You know, does Paul and his new glider have the seatbelt on correctly? You know, and there's a lot of other things too. You know, don't forget the assembly. You probably want to do that a few times with the person if you can. Uh, assembly, disassembly, learn about some things there. Uh, trailer setup maybe for the cross country. Weight and balance. This is something strongly encouraged in new to you gliders is that you redo a weight and balance. Many of them have never been weighed and have a weight and balance that is way out of date and has been modified so much. I know a few horror stories where they found them way outside of the envelope with a pilot in it. Uh, cross country, it's kind of going beyond. That's something beyond this scope. And the SSA has a new program with cross country training coming out that may be interesting to learn more about. But you probably want to talk about a satellite tracker, um, personal locator beacon. Maybe that's something that the club member has never thought about or dealt with. Comfort, food, water. It's something we do try to cover in initial training, but people don't experience it until they get out there. Having their trailer set, you know, the gutches, the canopies, the latches, the ground handling too, you know, this is new and different. And this is where mistakes can be made that are expensive. Um, you know, also, if buying a used glider, looking at some of the ground handling equipment that may have never really been used that much. You know, it's not uncommon to find ground handling equipment equipment in a new to you glider that needs some repair or like wing wheel or tail dolly tubes that need to be replaced. Um, you know, recommendations of where things might be stored or how to use them. All of that, you know, is a way to go through. And then, you know, this is true in aviation as you, you step up, but very true in the glider world. You know, so you want to know how a GP-15 glider flies, you know, sweet looking ship. You want to get one. <laughs> you have the resources available to you, you know, and how do you know how it flies? Or how do you know the flight characteristics? You go out and you end up buying one. That's how you find out how well, uh, you know, a GP-15 or whatever else does fly. Um, you know, there's a lot of truth to that. It is a running joke, but there is a lot of truth to that. And the flight characteristics are different for each glider. You know, it can even change by serial numbers. Uh, you know, I have this about the type of glider I fly, but differences in elevators, stabilators, wide tails, V tails that you might see, spoilers, dive brakes, you know, the standard Cirrus is a good example. This is one that has the modification to it, um, but the original ones didn't have the dual plate and you'd extend the dive brakes all the way up and it'd open up a nice two inch gap or so between the dive brake and the top of the wing, letting air flow through and re-energize. It actually, <laughs> was better, more effective, it seems, to have the dive brakes down like this instead of fully extended. You know, and then you get into gliders that may be different. You know, the 135s that don't have dive brakes, but just use flaps exclusively, the Pic-20 or the Salto, you know, where it uh, turns into a whole flat plate type of thing. And even in the manuals, you can find some stuff. Sometimes it's very direct. Uh, most instructors that teach in the K21s are familiar with this, but you do a full side slip and you basically can be there and don't need to hold in the rudder once you get it in there. You can take it off. But in order to get out of it, you got to tap, you know, the opposite direction rudder. So if you're, you know, doing a side slip where you got a big right rudder, you end up having to tap the left rudder in order to get it out of the side slip. And then sometimes it can be um, very subtle. You know, I used to teach in the Groves, and this is one of the things with them, is it talks about side slipping and says, you know, using this method to end the slip does not adopt unusual flight attitudes and deviates only slightly. So what if you don't use this method? What does it do? And that's one of the things you can find out. 
is if you're going to, if you're being ham fisted with it and you walk the tail back and forth a couple times, the turbulent airflow off of the canopy will block the tail in the elevator and basically stall it and it pitches down. <laughs> it's one of those things. If you know about it, it's great. If you don't and experience it, it's not that good. And we all know about the effects of flying gliders in rain. You see that just there. And that's, you got to have discussions about the performance of it. You know, um, some of the things that people may not think about in terms of what is the effect on percentage in, when you hit sync in a higher performance glider. You know, people always think, oh, you know, great glide performance. Well, you know, if you're running downwind with a high glide performance over terrain, you might not be clearing obstacles by all that much. And small little deviations in lift or sink will have huge effects on that. And even wingspan in terms of things like landing out, airports available and all that. So that being said, you know, as we get here near the end to this, just a couple more minutes is be a high minimums captain. You know, give yourself some room, manage distractions, get in some hours before going cross country. I will specifically note it is in gliders, it seems to be at about that 25 hour mark from what I have seen in my research. Um, it seems to be a high rate of accidents and incidents in less than 25 hours time and type. Uh, it, it definitely flattens out from there um, with it, you know, but document your performance, seek some further refresher training is all good. Now, what we do have available now too, which is absolutely terrific, um, is we have things that are available to us today that haven't been in the past. And you can't see it because uh, I got the back screen on, but I'm in my home office, which has this device that I've been putting together. I won't say cobbling because that has not been the case, uh, but basically bought a soaring simulator base and then bought a gaming system and have things like Condor 2 Pro loaded on it specifically because it has a bunch of different aircraft and can look at the layout and look at the flight performance of those aircraft and be able to do some things associated with transition training with some people, you know, and also other programs are improving. This and what you see on the screenshot is X-Plane 12. Uh, that's not Condor 2, but that's X-Plane 12, which has greatly improved in its soaring model. I have played with it some. I like it. I haven't tried yet, but the Microsoft Flight Sim and the versions of that uh, late 2022 had a significant uh, glider upgrade slash update. Um, my son, who has played with Condor for a few years, uh, uploaded that um, over the holidays, and he has played with it on his device and likes it. I just don't have the experience with it. But, you know, this is something that's becoming available for us to work with people when the weather's bad to get them into thinking about and understanding the performance of their new glider, new to them glider, to get some layout, where things are, what the switches do, all of that, even if it's put away or they haven't seen it yet. May not be exact, but I think it is a good way. Now, the last little thing I'll mention, because it does apply to transition training and gliders, is what a former FAA administrator was calling a four-letter word, the LODA. But what it, the reason why is because that was used as a stopgap um, with a legal interpretation. And that is now gone. It's no longer needed. I would strongly encourage people to take a look at this FAA policy published on February 8th. You probably can find links to it um, through EAA, AOPA, and others uh, with it. The stopgap requirement that required either experimental aircraft owners to get a letter of deviation authority or instructors like myself 
providing training in experimental aircraft to get a letter of deviation authority. That is gone. However, the loaded requirement that existed prior to that and still does exist that allows for the providing of an aircraft for transition training uh, while being compensated does exist. It did exist and it still does exist. And if you're gonna be providing instruction and the aircraft in an experimental aircraft, I would strongly encourage you to be doing your research on this. Usually for the FAA, this is to provide specific transition training following a syllabus that is reviewed and other criteria. It also usually cannot be used for training for a rating, certificate, operating privilege, et cetera. Probably one of the most common things that we know in the glider community that is associated with this LOTA authority is, um, I think it's Desert Aerospace that does the jet sailplane training down in the Southwest. You know, they have a LOTA in order to be able to use an experimental aircraft specifically for training. And I bring this up because it is something that I've noticed within the glider world um, that occasionally we see some things that probably, I can't say definitively, but probably need to be operating under a LOTA. And I'm not sure that they always are. Uh, you know, you will occasionally see people providing training in self-launch, winch launch, camps, cross-country competitions, you know, kind of ride-alongs. And I don't know their particular aircraft. I don't know if their standard airworthiness certificate, which is not an issue, but if it's experimental airworthiness certificate, and they're basically doing what we would call holding it out to the public, um, you really should should be having a LOTA associated with that. And that policy talks about it a little bit more and gives you some examples. But basically, you know, if you're providing both the instruction in the aircraft and you're advertising or broadly offering it and compensation beyond the expenses of the aircraft, i.e. making money at it or being paid for the aircraft and the instruction, you need to be doing it under a LOTA. Uh, type of thing. And I had come across this with something else, but I will mention it, is the EAA with their webinar week uh, thing they did a few weeks ago, is they had a plan to talk about the LOTA that was needed for the instructors, but they actually modified it because it had changed regulatory, and they do talk about the load is required for providing the aircraft that existed before and still do exist. And this is a terrific little webinar by uh, Tom Chapentier at EAA on it. And you can take a look at that there. You do need to be a member uh, in order to log in and watch the recording. You didn't need to be a member to watch the live webinar, but you do need it to watch the recording. So are you a proficient pilot? You know, annual checking really helps being part of an organization. You know, you wanna fly regularly with a CFI, practice, use the WINGS program if it's available. We've had tremendous uh, increase in the glider pilots using the WINGS program. So I wanna thank you there. And that is available. You find your local WINGS Pro. You know, part one of that is the knowledge, which you're getting a little bit tonight. You need the three credits of knowledge one, two, and three. You also need the three credits for flight, which for gliders, here's some of the activity numbers. If you wanna jot those down quick so that you can find them quickly and easily on fasafety.gov and what the topics end up covering. There is still the uh, wings industry wing sweepstakes. It is changing a little bit. You find out more information about it here, uh, but a great way to um, move things forward and a terrific motivator for the WINGS program. It's changing into quarterly related items um, from manufacturers and sponsors. 
And they also do want us to talk about the safety management system coming to general aviation too. You're seeing it in a regulatory context, but really the big thing is this is something that any organization should be following is there's four parts to a safety management system, but establishing a safety policy that is written down and that you know all the members of that community are responsible for. Having safety risk management, but finding analyzing, assessing, and controlling the hazards that may exist, whether it be weather, airport conditions, aircraft conditions, whatever it may be, you know, checking to make sure that you are doing the right thing when you do find those risks. And last but not least, which is really what we do here in the FAST team, is continuing with that safety promotion. You want more information on the safety management system, you can find it at that web address or at that QR code. So I do want to thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, you know, you help all you instructors out there. I'm happy, really happy to see that many glider instructors uh, in the audience. So I do appreciate that and uh, look forward to seeing you again soon.